How many of you have ever checked out this website? All right. So there it is, WebMD, better information, better health. Actually, that's not true. It's actually this. WebMD, convince yourself that you have a terminal illness. <laughs> How many of you have done that? All right. You know, is there something about, you know, that when we start having symptoms and, and then you can look them up online now, not just on WebMD, but you can get everyone else's opinion about them as well. And sometimes we can convince ourselves uh, that something terrible is going wrong, but maybe sometimes something is. This morning I want you to uh, engage your imagination once again with me. So this morning I want you to imagine that you are a Jewish man living in Israel in the first century AD. So are you guys with me ladies? I'm sorry, but just try. All right. All right. And you are at work one day and you notice on your hand a little spot. It's kind of whitish looking and it concerns you a little bit. And so, of course, on your break, you grab your phone, and not really, but, and you pull up WebMD and, and, and you start looking through the things and one of the possibilities that comes up is leprosy. But you're like, no, 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 that, that can't be true. And you go home and, 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 and you reluctantly share it with your wife and she kind of looks and says, oh, it's probably nothing, honey. But her face says, that's not what she's really thinking. The next day you notice it's a little bit bigger, it's a little worse, it continues, and eventually you and your wife agree, I need to go before the priest, right? This is the, their, their prescription for what they would do. And so they went before the priest, and the priest says, yeah, this looks like leprosy, and you need to be in isolation for two weeks, and then we'll make the final di diagnosis. Now, I just want us to imagine this morning, what do you think those two weeks were like for, for that man, right? Can you imagine two weeks, right? And no cell phone, no internet, no TV, right? Just waiting in isolation, fearing the worst. And then, and then just a little while later, at the end of that two weeks, the worst is confirmed. You have leprosy. And what that means is you will now have to live isolated from your family, from your friends, from your former life, and you'll have to go live with other lepers, and you'll live alone apart from your family for the rest of your life. Now, how many of you would say, that seems and feels hopeless? Are you with me this morning? This morning, as we think about this man, and we're going to read about him in Matthew chapter 8 in just a moment, but as we think about him, as he thinks about now that he can't go home and hug his wife and kids, Right? He can't scoop up his kids and play with them anymore. He can't even come within a few hundred feet of them. And he will just await death. And he really epitomizes hopelessness. And maybe this morning, he'd say, you know what? I can kind of identify with this guy. Now, I hope none of you have leprosy, right? Because it's contagious. So, we're not worried about that. But maybe you could say, you know what, I, it's not leprosy, but I can identify. Maybe it is a health challenge that you face in life that, that just causes you to feel hopeless. Maybe it's circumstances that you're going through. But whatever it is, the one thing that it makes you feel is alone. Right? There's something about walking through difficult circumstances that just makes us feel lonely. Right? And even here at camp, right, and you're surrounded by people all the time, but even here, when you're surrounded by people all the time, I know that sometimes we can feel lonely. Right? Because it feels like, although I'm around everyone and I'm talking to people, no one here really knows what's going on inside. No one really knows what I'm carrying. And it's a lonely, lonely feeling. And I know without a doubt that this man was feeling and experiencing that loneliness, that hopelessness. And so what I want us to think about this morning is what do we do? What can we do? You know, we began to talk about the subject of hope yesterday and how Jesus offers us real hope. But I want us to kind of look at what this man did and what he experienced, how God gave him hope, and then consider what that means for our own experiences. So if you have your Bible this morning, Matthew chapter 8, and we're going to look just at the first three verses. Matthew uh, chapter 8. And in Matthew chapter 8, we're going to find that uh, Jesus has just finished the Sermon on the Mount. He's just finished this, this powerful and long discourse that he's given. He's come down off of the mountain. And this man, this hopeless man, 
right, who is living in a leper colony, who's separated, who's living alone, he hears that Jesus is coming near. And he's going to do something very crazy, very audacious, and we're going to see what he does. So look with me, and let's read the first two verses together in Matthew chapter 8. The Bible says that when Jesus came down from the mountain, large crowds followed him. And right away, a man with a serious skin disease came up and knelt before him, saying, Lord, if you're willing, you can make me clean. Now, can you just sort of picture that scene this morning, right? Jesus has come down off the mountain, and he's sort of coming into a town probably, and, and there's large crowds following him. And all of a sudden, this guy with leprosy makes a decision to really break the law he leaves the leper colony and he goes out and he presents himself to Jesus. He has obviously heard about Jesus. He has heard about this rabbi whose teaching is different from any other rabbi that's ever been teaching in Israel. He's heard about his miracles. He's heard about the things that he's doing. And he comes out and he bows before him and he says, Lord, if you're willing, you can make me clean. Right? This man exercises incredible faith and hope in Jesus. Because he's in a hopeless situation. He is an absolutely in an utterly hopeless situation. And yet he dares, he dares to hope in Jesus and his power to heal. He believes, he says, Jesus, Jesus, if you're willing, if you're willing, you can make me clean. Jesus, if you're willing, you can take away this leprosy. Jesus, if you're willing, you can make it so that I can go home again and hug my wife and pick up my children. Jesus, if you're willing, you can touch this hopeless place in my life. It says that he came up and he knelt before him. I, I would kneel down and kind of mimic that, but I probably wouldn't be able to get back up very easily, so I won't do that. But he knelt before him, and I imagine that after he makes this bold request, as he's kneeling before Jesus, I sort of imagine him there with his eyes closed, right? Just kneeling before Jesus. He's laid out this bold request, and now he's there with his eyes closed waiting. And what do you suppose, he's wait what do you suppose he thinks is going to come next, or is hoping is going to come next? Somebody help me out. Yes. That Jesus will heal him. Absolutely. And I'm thinking that he's expecting to hear Jesus say something. I'm thinking he's expecting Jesus to say, I am willing, you're clean. I am willing, you're healed. But that's not what happens first. Something extraordinary happens first. Look at verse 3. Because before he hears something, he feels something. Before he hears something, he feels something. He feels someone touch him. No one touches a leper because it's contagious and it's against the law. But he feels a touch. Look at verse 3. Reaching out his hand, he touched him. He touched him. Then, after he touched him, he said, I am willing. Be made clean. And immediately his disease was healed. Now, there's a lot of purpose and meaning in Matthew, including the story in his gospel account. And there was a lot going on there in this scene. And one of the things that Jesus was displaying was his power over the law, his power over creation. Right? Because normally, right, that if you touched a leper, you now also were considered unclean. You were ceremoniously unclean. You'd have to go into isolation and prove that you didn't catch it. Right? The law would be prescribed. But Jesus was greater than the law. In fact, not only that, that but not only did Jesus not become unclean by touching him, the man became clean. And Jesus demonstrated his great power in this moment. But he touched him. He touched him and he healed him. And he gave him back his hope again. Can you imagine how this man felt? Right, he has been at the bottom, right, at the most hopeless and lonely place that a person could be in, separated from his family, awaiting death of a fatal disease, alone and separated from his family. But he reaches out to Jesus in faith and in humility. And Jesus touches him. And Jesus heals him. Now, I want us to shift our thinking now to our story. 
in our situation. And it's probably not leprosy that's causing you to lose hope, but maybe there's something in your life, like we said earlier, that's causing you to feel hopeless and alone this morning. And I don't know what it is. Maybe, like we said earlier, it's a health challenge. Right? Maybe it's something physical that you're going through, a struggle in your health, and it's just causing you to feel hopeless. Maybe it's a relationship struggle. Right? Maybe it's a relationship issue with your parents. I know most all of you get along perfectly all the time with your parents, right? Is that true? No, not all the time. Teenage years are tough. You'll survive, they'll survive. But maybe it's more than just the normal teenage parent struggles that we sometimes go through. Maybe there's some real issues at home and it's causing you to feel hopeless. Maybe your parents are divorced or getting divorced and you feel hopeless about it. You feel alone. You feel like no one understands. No one's going through. Maybe it's a friend or a classmate or somebody that you have a broken relationship with. It could be just some unknowns about your future. It could be a habit that you have that you hate and you want to get rid of and you hate it and you tried and you failed and you feel hopeless. It could be a struggle with anxiety or depression. Or there's so many things that make us feel alone and make us feel hopeless. And so I want us to think this morning, what do I do with this hopelessness, with this loneliness? Because these things can strangle hope out of our lives. They make hope hard. And we talked yesterday about how Jesus offers us a real hope, right? He, he offers us real hope. And what we saw this morning is that sometimes God gives hope through his miraculous hand. And God is still able to do that today. But sometimes his hope comes in less obvious ways or less, you know, in the moment ways. He doesn't always heal. He doesn't always remove our circumstances. He doesn't always fix it. And so what do we do then? What do we do when we've prayed and asked God, we said, God, would you fix this? Would you take this away? Would you help me? I'm hopeless and I need your power in this situation. It seems like God isn't doing anything. It seems like nothing's changing. It seems like things aren't getting better. Maybe it feels like they're getting worse. What does God want you to do? How does he want us to respond? How do we handle that situation? I want us to go back to the text this morning, verses 1 and 2, and make just two observations about what this man did because I believe they give us keys to what God wants us to do because when it comes to hope, right, Jesus offers you a real and living hope. But he also calls you to be proactive in experiencing that hope. That experiencing the hope of God is not something that happens when we are passive, but actually when we are proactive. So notice with me two things. First of all, the leper took a huge, huge step of faith. Right? It was a huge step of faith for him to break the law and to present himself before Jesus and to make this statement. Right? I believe right, that you have the power to heal me. If you're willing, you can make me clean. He exercised incredible faith in Christ. And so if you and I are going to experience hope for our hopeless places, we need also to take steps of faith towards God. Right, that sometimes God is going to call you, right, because faith is, is acting on what we believe and know, not what we see. Right, it's, it's easy sometimes in life to want to walk by sight rather than by faith. How many of you would say, I've experienced that? All right. I know I, I, when I was going through a difficult season a few years ago, I was having lunch with a pastor a friend of mine, and I said, you know, it is just so much more comfortable to walk by sight than by faith. Right, we preach about faith, we talk about faith, but it's not always comfortable. And it's not always easy, but it always honors God. And God always honors our responses of faith to Him. And so the question is, do I really believe that God can give me hope? Do I believe that Jesus offers hope? If Jesus says that He has hope, do I believe that? And am I willing to take a step of faith towards Him? Faith always takes action. Faith is never passive. Right? The leper took steps towards Jesus. He went to him. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 6 says this. It says, Without faith it is impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Right? God rewards those who earnestly, who wholeheartedly, with everything that they are, seek after him. And so in our hopeless places, whatever that hopeless place is for you, Whatever that hopeless situation, health situation, relationship situation, family issue, habit, depression, anxiety, 
Whatever that thing is that's making you feel alone and isolated and hopeless, it's in that very place that God is calling you to say, would you take a step of faith towards me? Would you trust me? Would you come to me in faith, believing that I can do something about it? Not only did the leper take a huge step of faith, but he also humbled himself. He humbled himself. He bowed down before Jesus. And if you and I are going to experience the hope of God in our life, the hope that Jesus alone can give, it requires us to humble ourselves before God. It requires us to come to the end of ourself. Right? Because hope isn't about manufacturing it for ourselves. You know, so many times we think, I've got to be strong enough. Right? I've got to be strong enough. I've got to be strong enough to handle this. I've got to be strong enough to get through this. Maybe even have to tell you people, hey, you're strong. You can do this. But here's the thing. None of us are strong. Right? We might be strong and compared to somebody else, but we're all weak. Every one of us. But that's not a problem, right? Because it's our weaknesses, right? It's in our weaknesses that God's power works best in our life. Right? It's in the weaknesses that God is able to display His grace and His power and His glory. And your weakness is the perfect place for God's power to be at work. But in order to experience that, you have to humble yourself before Him. You have to bow yourself before Him and admit your need. Right, and say, Lord, I need you. I need your power. I need your touch. I can't get through this alone. You know, we don't just bow our lives before God for salvation, right? And, and then that's a one-time thing, like, God, I, I, I'm a sinner. I want you to forgive me. I want you to come into my life. I believe in you. I believe you're the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And then, then we just go on with our life. No, that's not how it works. We, we need to continually humble ourselves before God. James chapter 4, verse 10. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and He will exalt you. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and He will exalt you. If you're in a hopeless place, you have to come to that end of yourself and to say, I recognize I need Jesus. Right? I recognize I'm in a hopeless place. I recognize I need God's power and God's touch. And I humble myself before Him. We all need hope. Right? Hope is something we can't live without. And it's something that your Father in Heaven does not want you to live without. Your Father in Heaven does not desire that you would live without hope. Right? You know, as, as a parent, right, I can tell you that I want my children to have hope. Right? I, I want them to know Jesus. I want them to know His hope. Right? I want to inspire hope in them as a parent. And I want you to know your Father in Heaven desires that you would know His hope, even in the midst of the most difficult circumstances. And here's the thing that I want us to focus on this morning, is that Jesus offers you something greater than just fixing your circumstances. You know, so many times I, I have thought that my greatest issue, my greatest problem is that, God, I just need you to fix my circumstances. God, I just need you to change this. Have you ever been there? Like, and God, I just want you to zap this situation, right? I just, I just want you to fix it. I want you to change it. I want, that, that's what I need. I need my circumstances changed. And here's the thing. Sometimes God does work in our life in a way that changes our circumstances, but sometimes He doesn't. But what He offers you then is something greater, something far greater than just fixing your circumstances. What He offers you is Himself. You see, what God wants you to know is that He has made Himself available to you, right? That, that we have the privilege of not just knowing about God, but knowing Him. Right? Just the God of all of creation, the God of glory and splendor has made a way for you and I to know Him through Jesus Christ, through His sinless life and His sacrificial death, through His resurrection from the dead. God has made a way by faith that we may know Him. And God wants you to know Him deeply. And so He wants you to know that, that He offers you Himself. Jesus offers His life given for you, in you. Look at Colossians chapter 1, verse 27. It says, To them God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. You see, God offers you Christ in you, with you. And He knows what it's like to suffer. He knows what it's like to feel alone. Right? As alone as you may have ever felt, and I don't ever minimize that because circumstances can make us feel so alone, but I want you to know that Jesus knows 
more than anyone what it's like to be alone. Right? At the, the lowest moment, the most difficult, most agonizing, most excruciating point of his life, as he was in the garden, wrestling with what was about to happen the next day, as he was about to go to the cross, as he was in agony to the point of sweating drops of blood, he asked his disciples, he said, would you watch with me? Would you pray with me? Don't leave me alone. And what did they do? They fell asleep. Jesus knows what it's like to be alone. In Isaiah, the prophet speaking of the, the Messiah, the Deliverer who would come, he said he's a man of sorrows and acquainted with the bitterest of grief. Listen, Jesus doesn't just offer you hope, he offers you his compassion and his kindness because he knows and understands. Listen, I don't understand the depth of the hurt of your heart. I don't know all that you're going through. You don't know all that I'm going through, but Jesus does. He sees and he knows and he cares. And he says, here's, here's, Paul wrote to the church, he says, here's the glorious riches of this mystery. It's Christ in you, the hope of glory. And Jesus is able to make hope abound in your heart and in your life, despite your circumstances. Before he healed the leper, right, before he healed the leper, what did he do? He touched him. He touched him. He didn't have to touch him, right? He could have just spoken. He didn't have to touch him, but he was willing to touch him. And I want you to know this morning that Jesus is willing to touch the hopeless places of your life. Like he is willing to touch the hopeless parts of your life. Whatever it is, he's not put off by it. He's not scared by it. He's not offended by it. He loves you so much. And he wants to touch that area of your life. And he wants to bring his healing and his hope. And sometimes he will miraculously intervene. Sometimes God will miraculously intervene in such a way that he heals or removes the circumstance. But sometimes he doesn't. And when he doesn't, he wants us to be just as proactive in coming to him in faith and in humility and trusting him. Because here's what he offers you. He offers you a living hope. He offers you a living hope that is more than just for your circumstances here and now. Right? Christ has promised us life in his kingdom forever and ever. Right? We sang about that in the last verse of that hymn this morning. Right? That, that our hope ultimately doesn't lie in this age and in this life. That our hope ultimately lies in the fact that in Christ he's given us eternal life. Life in his kingdom forever and ever and ever where we will know and glorify and worship and praise Jesus and the Father through the power of the Spirit forever. And the Bible says that in His kingdom, there will be no sickness, there will be no pain, there will be no crying. Right? Those things will be gone. And so our hope that we have is, is more than just about our present circumstances. It's about the glory of His kingdom and our future with Him. So what do we do now? We have to be proactive. We have to be proactive. What does God want you to do? He wants you to take a step of faith today. In that hopeless place of your life, he says, would you not take a step of faith? And I want to encourage you, if you're in a hopeless place, if you're in a lonely place, take a step of faith. What does that look like? Well, it, it might be different for all of us, but let me suggest a couple things. Take a step of faith and say, you know what? I'm going to open God's word and I'm going to read his promises. I'm going to take a step of faith and I'm going to pray and ask God to help me through this. I'm going to take a step of faith and, and share with somebody that I trust, my counselor, me, your faculty member, somebody and say, I'm going to just, I'm going to take a step of faith and say, I believe that God wants to give me hope and God often works his hope through others, right? That's why he's given us each other. I'm going to take a step of faith, but also a step of humility that I am going to absolutely acknowledge, God, I need you. I can't do this. God, I need your help. I, I cannot do it without you. Listen, Jesus is your hope. He is your hope and he is waiting to give you that hope today. Let Jesus touch those hopeless parts of your life by coming to him in faith and bowing before him in humility. Would you let me pray for you this morning? Father in heaven, I pray for all of us this morning. Father, because we all face hopeless circumstances in life. And Father, I pray this morning that you remind every one of us that Jesus is willing to touch those places in our life. So Father, help us to take steps of faith and help us to bow ourselves in humility before you that we might encounter your hope. Father, I thank you that you're willing to touch those hopeless places in our life. And Father, I pray there would be no one here this morning that wouldn't reach out to you and reach out to someone so that they might experience your hope in their life. 
And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.